Uh, first off, apologies for the weird get-up. I'm in the middle of two scans. What you see behind me is the MEG scanner here at the, the unit where I work. Um, so I'll be trying to articulate through my mask, but if anything is unclear, I'd be happy to, to answer any potential questions in the end um, if, you, if you lost my, uh, uh, my voice. Um, speaking of unclarities, uh, this is Ivo. He's my newborn. Uh, he looks a bit larger because he's just a very big baby. Um, but he's relatively newborn. So if I come across a bit frazzled, uh, this is very much a baby induced sleep deprived state that I'm currently in. Uh, so please do, um, you know, ask for any clarifications where you need afterwards. Uh, I will not be offended at all if you didn't get my, uh, my train of thought. Um, what I will be talking about today is this longitudinal study that we actually set up well before COVID hit and uh, that comprises two different groups. Uh, so one of the groups, we actually went out into schools, um, a, a, a bunch of them around here in Cambridge, or at least relate villages around Cambridge, and a few in Nor Norfolk and Suffolk as well. And the idea is that we really want to know how, uh, in particular, socioeconomic status impacts um, children's cognition, mental health and attitudes, um, and also how those interrelate to each other. And uh, so this is the, the sample we collected in schools. And then we also had a bunch of children come into the unit uh, to go undergo MRI scanning and MEG scanning, basically just to you know, look at their brains in various different ways and see where the, the interesting things are happening. And particularly how socioeconomic status has its effect on the brain and on um, you know, cognition, all the things I'll show you. Uh, so these are children in years four, three and four, uh, about seven to nine years old. Uh, we had about 600 in schools that we've seen and about 100 in the unit that we've seen. Um, so that's the sample that we had prior to this pandemic. Uh, we've collected this, the, all of their, their data and um, that's you know, where we were left off when COVID hit. Um, what we normally do with that is basically look at the relationship between different variables, so some cognitive variables, maybe some educational outcomes, things like consensuousness, like attitudes essentially, uh, mental health and socioeconomic status in particular is what we really are interested in. And what we also do is light out the brain in various different ways and check whether, in this case, uh, a language given, uh, sorry, a language related uh, phenomenon, how, how that is related. So just showing you this without very much context to clarify that we are psychologists and cognitive neuroscientists. Um, and we just had this sample lying around to be recontacted. And that's the project that I'll be talking about today. So essentially, when this pandemic hits, um, what we were uh, given was this opportunity to look at children who we had re recent previous data from and to see how lockdowns and other policy implementations affected them. So we felt kind of a, a responsibility to, to do that. And when I say we, I mean a little bit of me and a really big bit of Giacomo Bignardi, who is one of our PhD students in the lab, um, the lab here being the uh, Duncan Astle's lab in uh, the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. Um, so all of the people in bold here are somehow involved in this project and uh, the majority of all of the, the work has actually been done by our wonderful student Giacomo. Uh, I just wanted to preface that because he really is to credit with all of the stuff that I'll be talking about right now. Um, okay, so COVID hit, we had this pre-existing data, what did we do? We essentially just tried to get back in touch with families. We have some of their contact information, so we sent out questionnaires, and those questionnaires um, went out to a specific subgroup. So as I said, we had about 600 children that we seen in schools, and about 92 in the end, about 100 that we tried to get in the lab. And we got back about 114 from the school group and about 54 from the lab group. So a subsample, a much smaller subsample than we started off with. And this is biased in several ways. Specifically, we found that the people who were more likely to respond were the, the, the people who were you know, slightly better off on the socioeconomic status ladder. So keep that in mind when you check our findings. Um, this is a slightly richer sample than, than we initially had. And the initial sample was relatively representative of the UK in general. So what I'm talking about is mostly generalizable to slightly richer families, essentially. Um, what we sent them was um, the, um, the RCATS, we call it, and essentially has five anxiety questions and five depression-related questions, and is asking about symptoms of these disorders, not the actual disorders. These are not diagnostic tools. They are just asking about specific symptoms. Um, we have a version for children that we have pre-existing data of, 
for parents in case we have seen the parents and there's a teacher version as well but we didn't end up using that um we also have the strengths and difficulties questionnaire and i imagine you're familiar with the the whole thing but it has a few different uh sub skills and the sub skill that we tended to use here was the emotional symptom sub skill uh, which you know asks about symptoms of emotional um well-being essentially we'll come back to the specific items a bit later um, so these are the things that parents were given, um, you know, via email. They just conducted the questionnaire online and uh, that allowed us to compare the current, and I say current, but that's during the first lockdown and a wee bit thereafter. The majority of responders were during the first lockdown. Um, so not that current anymore, but that was essentially a current data during lockdown and we can compare it with uh, data roughly a year prior. Um, so what did we find? Um, I'm going to guide you through these, these graphs because um, they are slightly more complex than, than we give them credit for. So essentially what we have is this pre-existing sample, two different groups of uh, raters. So either we have the children or the teachers rating themselves or, or their pupils. And we also have in the, the, the group that we saw in the lab, we have parent reports. So parent reports are brilliant because we can just compare them before lockdown and during lockdown. And that's a really nice direct comparison, right? You can see increases or decreases in that or you know, a st stable kind of uh, flow. And that's what those dark blue lines are. Now, the kind of challenge here is that we also have ratings for uh, children that aren't given by, um, uh, by the parents. So you can directly compare those to the outcomes in the end. And the way we solve that is by you know, complicated statistical modeling um, and the plots that I'll show you here is essentially kind of rectified for that comparison. So teachers and parents, they don't rate very differently. Children and parents, they do. And we'll see that in a second. The first thing I'm going to show you here is good news. Um, the emotional problems questionnaire that we use did not show any difference pre uh, during lockdown to before lockdown. So actually, that's kind of stable. That's really good. Children don't really see, or at least you don't see any effects on children in this particular kind of scenario. This is when we ask about anxiety. And um, one thing that I will note here is that for the children, we had every child rating themselves. Parents, we had ratings of both children and parents. So some of these kids here, we have both parents and child ratings. And that's how we can kind of translate between the two, again, with these like slightly more complex statistical models. And one of the things you see there that you have to account for is that children rate themselves slightly higher than their parents uh, on average, um, which is just a feature of who does the rating. Um, so we, we do account for that and you know, that is all um, you know, accounted for in, in some, some way. I can go into detail later, but I, I assume that most of you are not um, sitting around here waiting for a statistic lesson. The crucial thing here is that if we look at the anxiety questions in the RCAS questionnaire that we used, we also don't really see any difference. Uh, so again, good news. And then um, sadly, we also have a bit of bad news. And that is if we look at um, depression related symptoms, we, we unfortunately do see that kids have a slight increase. I say a slight increase, these are all normalized scores. Um, so we take essentially the, um, the scores that kids give on individual questions and we uh, normalize those where zero is the average and, and one is the standard deviation. And the, the difference that we see from prior to the uh, lockdown to during lockdown is what we would call in this normalized space a, uh, a middle to large effect, essentially. Um, so it's, it's, it's a relatively big shift in answers. Uh, so that unfortunately means that what we've seen essentially during this, this first lockdown is that children's depressive symptoms increased during lockdown. So that's, that's basically what we show here. Um, and I think it's important that we then spend a wee bit of time contextualizing that. Um, because what we ask for is um, symptoms of depression and symptoms of anxiety. Um, and that's not necessarily the same as having depression or having an anxiety diagnos diagnosis. Um, and not everyone gets that. So I'm, I'm going to spend some time on it. Uh, so essentially, uh, we had articles coming out about our paper like this, where um, you know, people announced that the depression skyrocketed, which is A, using depression as you know, more or less the, the, the syndrome, and B, skyrocket is not necessarily the thing that I would use to, to qualify this. Um, there's a wee bit worse things as well, where essentially um, people are claiming that you know, 
kids are, are going uh, down the drain, which is also definitely not, not something that we, we claim in this, this paper. And then there's a whole host of, of uh, comments on Twitter that come down to very similar things, where essentially it just seems that what we're showing in this uh, paper is that kids are having the worst possible time and that we're really screwing up the youth by doing these lockdowns. So I would just like to show you the item level data that we, we have to basically quantify or at least qualify what the actual differences are. Um, so the top questions here, I'll let you read them yourself and I'll highlight some of them, are the SEQ emotional problem sub questions. Uh, so we ask parents or teachers, what do you think these children have? And essentially the only real difference we see is that, you know, kids seem a bit less worried in general. The next set of questions, I'll let you read them yourself again, are the anxiety sub-questions, and we didn't see any differences on those. Uh, what you see here in the black is the average, and this is a confidence interval around that average. If the confidence interval falls on the zero line, that means there's not really a difference at all, not measurable anyway. Um, so then we come to the arcades on the bottom, the depression questions. And, and this is where it's important to realize that these are symptoms and not the syndrome. We just ask about whether, you know, Kids feel like they don't want to move, whether kids are tired a lot, whether kids feel sad or empty, and whether you know, nothing's fun anymore for, for them or for, from their parents rating for them. Um, and we do see an increase in those. Um, so again, this is parents responding or children self-reporting, uh, which is very different from a actual diagnosis from an actual clinician. Um, so you know, this is worrying and, and not necessarily an ideal situation, but it's also good to keep in mind that it is definitely not the case that kids are suddenly spiking in depression according to this, uh, depression as in real diagnosis, or that other things that sometimes people associate with depression, like increased suicidality, um, that also is not something that we have actually measured in here. So in sum, our findings show relatively stable um, uh, anxiety symptoms and emotional problems, um, and increases in depressive symptoms rather than uh, actual diagnoses. Um, this is basically what I just said um, on the top. Uh, also important is that, again, um, we are psychologists and cognitive neuroscientists. We can only kind of include data on, on our own expertise, which is in uh, measuring cognition and measuring mental health in children mm -hmm. uh, and measuring their brain capacities. And it's not necessarily in any of the other uh, things that are related to pandemics and lockdowns. So I frequently get questions or I see people using papers like ours and ours to kind of argue against lockdowns or argue for like, you know, completely opening society or whatever kind of flavor of, um, uh, you know, wherever you are on that spectrum of being quite liberal, or quite conservative on when you should release uh, certain, certain measures. And this is just one piece of the puzzle. There are also epidemiological questions. And also when we talk to the teachers that you know, are in the schools that we visit for our data collection, many of them have additional problems with you know, feeling safe in their school if there, there isn't a lockdown, um, but also with having to cope with continuously changing policy. So even if you're, trying to optimize for uh, children's mental health, there's also a big part where you should also keep in mind how well teachers are doing because that in turn also impacts back on, on children themselves. So essentially, I'm just trying to, to get a wee bit of a disclaimer in here that whilst what we're showing is you know, an increase in depressive symptoms, which just isn't great during lockdowns, there are other aspects of lockdowns that should really be weighted into policy making um, before we're just you know using this as the one argument for or against uh, lockdown policies. Uh, so in summary, uh, what we see is that children increased on, on depressive symptoms, uh, but were actually relatively stable in their emotional problems and anxiety. Um, we are not the f we were one of the first people to show that in these you know, longitudinal studies. Uh, we are not the only ones to show stuff like this, and there's actually more and more data coming out that actually seems to be in line with this. Um, and one thing that I want to highlight here that we simply didn't have the power for, we didn't have the statistical power for it, uh, we didn't have enough participants essentially to fully explore all of the detailed other aspects that also lead to this. Um, but I'm also involved in an adult study into um, you know, 
looking at the effects of lockdowns and the pandemic in general. And in adults, the few things that we tend to see most are that people who do have pre-existing conditions, so they're already struggling in a like, mental health capacity, those are the most likely people to suffer extra during lockdowns as well. And particular drivers of that, or at least one really big driver of that is, is loneliness. So there are certain things that we see in adults that might you know, explain a wee bit of what we see in children. And another thing is that socioeconomic status is a large factor in the development uh, of children in normal times. We, we have at least seen that in our sample. And there's actually masses and masses of data on that. Um, and the current sample that we have is slightly too biased towards like, higher socioeconomic status to actually fully explore what the like, you know, financial and, and social status of our, our participants is and to see how that impacts their, their response to the pandemic. Um, you can imagine that might play a role as well. We just don't have the, the participants, the statistical power to show that here. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I think there's questions at the end and I shall now pass the baton over uh, to, to the next speaker and or back to Claire if you have uh, a kind of bridge.